Hi everyone, uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Louise Lavictoire and I'm the Interim Head of Science at the FBA. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of this uh, FBA seminar series where we're exploring the careers to date of the, the FBA fellows and uh, some of the key FBA projects. I hope you've enjoyed the, the series so far and if you've missed any of the talks, all of them are available now um, under the um, Discover and Learn tab on the FBA website and Rachel's will be uh, made available within the week. And um, if you're enjoying the series and you're not already an FBA member, you can also become a member uh, with the Join Us tab at the fba.org.uk. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rachel Stubbington to your screens. Uh, Rachel is an Associate Professor in Ecology and Environmental Sciences at Not Nottingham Trent University, where she teaches undergraduates, supervises PhDs and pursues her own research in temporary river ecology, which you're going to hear about today. A freshwater invertebrate community oncologist by trade. She's been a member of the FBA since 2007 and became a fellow in 2020. She's also editor-in-chief uh, for Fundamental and Applied Limnology. So welcome, Rachel, and uh, take it away when you're ready. Thank you very much. Thank and I'm so glad that you said that it's some um, fellows giving an overview of um, uh, their, yes, careers of research, because I gave you a title, which is Things I Am Interested In Right Now. Um, where, whereas I, I realise that the presentation that I've prepared is research that I've been involved in, um, uh, in a roughly chronological order. Um, so firstly, th thank you so much um, for the um, invite. Um, it really is a pleasure um, to speak to you about uh, temporary streams. I shall get to them, yes, before too long. Um, but first of all, um, <laughs> Uh, back where it all began. Look, lovely, lovely middle class upbringing. And it couldn't have started better. Look, there was a the village stream ran through our back garden. And um, so I was off to a flying, no, I wasn't off to a flying start. And um, you cannot see the stream from our garden. They sandbagged it up. They put a, grew a conifer over it. And yes, I was never allowed thickness of mud. Look at it. That's, that's, I was never allowed in due to my mother's aversion to even the thinnest of mud. And um, so, yes, I, I, I think once in my life I've been in that one stream. I was not guided towards a career in freshwater ecology from a young age. Oh, no. I went to Fitzharry's. Tim Sykes went to Fitzharry's too. Hey. Um, and biology was, yes, it's the only subject I didn't get. Yeah, it was my worst anyway. Let's just say that. And um, so, uh, for, for really high at level, I did. Uh, someone's uh, needs to mute themselves, please. Uh, I, I, I did uh, music because I quite fancied the idea of being Izzy Stradling when I grew up. Um, and I did um, media studies uh, because my dad said, well, you like watching films. Yes, true. Um, and I did French because I was um, very good at it. Um, so, yes, but at least at the point that I left school with those A-levels, I had the good sense to turn down a place to study film studies at Southampton and instead uh, I went to work in a cinema. I've seen Fight Club a lot of times and thankfully I did then have a, a um, advanced career move, as I thought at the time, and I went to work as a kennel maid. For hearing dogs for deaf people unfortunately fairly soon fell in love with their puppy manager and then he broke my heart and i had to run away and so i went to nottingham because i'd seen it on a cultural documentary series um back in the night yeah 1991 i always wanted to move to nottingham to experience its excellent culture um, and then i got a job in a fast food restaurant and I, I proceeded to toss about in this manner for a good four or five years until my mother said, you, you, you could think about going to university. And I said, fine, mum. And I sat in that room in the library, on the Nottingham Library, and I looked at a prospectus. And you can do environmental biology. I, 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 I can remember that moment and having no clue that you could study this for a living. Oh, right. Okay, I'm on the case now. Um, and so I did a A-level in the foothills beneath Nottingham Castle. 
Uh, I did biology A level as an evening course and I applied to the University of Nottingham and they said, no, sweetie. And I applied to Nottingham Trent and they said, come in, magical. And so in 2002, um, I was finally on the case um, and started my uh, degree level studies and with an inordinate fondness for terrestrial moss at that stage. And still, look at it, it's awesome. Um, but then the turning point was, yeah, I did my placement with the Environment Agency uh, in uh, Trentside. And yes, I, I, was, I was sold totally um, from, from day one, really, really early on. I think it was week one um, that I, I stood in my first river and Nigel Holmes um, taught us how to use macrophytes to assess ecological status. And I went on training courses uh, with Richard Chad. He taught me how to, oh, caddis flies. He taught me how to identify caddis flies. Um, and uh, there's, yes, there, there's the team um, that I worked with. I'm, I'm happy to say I can remember nearly everyone's name. And Martin, I still see and work with every year. Um, so yes, that was uh, an inspirational year. I never looked back after that. I didn't leave during my final year, in fact. And I was there the moment that Leslie Rippon found the UK's first hemimysis anomalous. She made that very strange noise. Uh, and yes, the bloody red mysid. Um, and so for my final year research project, I developed a very technical method to map its UK distribution, which involved laying on canal banks and looking into dark water at night using a torch. It attracted, it did attract a little attention, but what were the other people doing out at that time of night anyway? So I published that. That was my first um, uh, taste of the, the research uh, experience. And then at the point that I graduated in 2006, um, I, I could have at that stage gone and worked for the Environment Agency and I was so tempted, I think I would have enjoyed it uh, a lot. But Paul Wood, um, he's going to feature quite a lot in this presentation. <laughs> he's thinking, oh no. Um, and yes, he was advertising at that time a uh, NERC urgency grant, uh, a, well, position to work with him on a project looking at uh, invertebrate responses to drought in a near perennial chalk stream. So I, I head over the county border uh, to Loughborough and uh, started this position. So Paul had already done a lot of work looking at uh, the Little Stour, a largely perennial chalk stream uh, in Kent, and it had dried a couple of times in the 90s during drought and so we felt confident well he felt confident enough to go for the NERC uh, urgency grant to document its response to uh, and recovery from drying uh, in in the uh, mid noughties drought and uh, did it dry? <laughs> no, this is going to be a, a repeating theme in my research um, that took much to our surprise, didn't dry, didn't let this deter us. And instead of studying responses to drying, uh, we studied responses to low flow, severe low flow, severe drought. Um, and one of the novel aspects of this research was that it didn't just look at the benthic invertebrates, it had a paired approach um, sampling the hyperic invertebrates from subsurface sediments uh, as well. So these papers uh, presented that research. And so, so the original idea was, do uh, macroinvertebrates move into the hyperoic zone in response to drying? But we didn't have any drying. The whole point of a refuge such as the hypothesized Hyperic refuge is that it promotes survival during disturbance. There must be some agent of mortality. I love that phrase. 
and so during floods you're on to a winner if you're in the surface stream you're probably going to be whisked downstream if you're in the hyperic zone as so long as you haven't got a bed scourer you're on to a winner then during drying it makes sense to migrate vertically to stay in submerged uh, saturated sediments but during low flows it's it's not it's just just quite nice isn't it if you're living in a river it's it's yes moderate hydrological conditions so it was a concern but we did find a really strong response uh, to temperature in these streams so the benthic invertebrate communities this is the point at which we'd expected to find them moving into the hyperic zone in august in response to the lowest flows and we were expecting drying but what we actually found uh, was that it was the month before that and what was striking about this month um, so you can see decline in benthic densities peak of hyperic densities and decline in benthic richness stability of hyperic richness and it was a, it looks like a threshold was passed a thermal threshold that triggered triggered uh, those migrations into the hyperic <clears throat> so um the next paper then looked at the taxonomic uh, community the, the tax are driving that change and it was twofold in fact and um, one thing we found was that um, all of the critters of the underworld came up into the hyperic sediment. So we had several of the eyeless white things, uh, the stiger bites, um, that, that just rocketed. And um, so perhaps they were scooting away from really low oxygen concentrations in the groundwater. And at the same time, this is the the most dominant uh, critter in these streams, Gamerus pulex. And if we look at the hyperic proportion of its total benthic plus hyperic population, far more of that total population occurred in the hyperic zone in that uh, warmest of months. So we identified a thermal driver of hyperic uh, migrations, vertical migrations. So that one showed the tax behind it. Um, I want to quickly just show you one of the papers I'm most proud of being involved with. Um, just, I, I, I was going to say a little study, but no, this is just an awesome study that um, Petter um, led. So I, I had another look at the spreadsheet this morning. It was 3,773 3, um, shrimps that he sexed and he measured and and look at what you can see if you do study the population level responses just we usually just consider the total but he looked at the juveniles the females the males and within the females which ones are productive and non-reproductive and look we've got this just the re reproductive females wiped out um, and the juveniles also uh, that population decimated. So I'm not going to go into that, but just to say it can get you a lot of insights into what's going on in a population level response. Oh, then, so that was 10 months. We did a lot in 10 months. Um, and then sadly, I really didn't fancy a PhD. It did sound like a lot of hard work. Um, unfortunately, peak of that procession, um, couldn't find a job, so <laughs> I'm quite pleased about it now, uh, did do a PhD and we took common ideas from the, the uh, drought work that said, what about if we explore these ideas in temporary streams, streams that, that aren't just um, affected during drought years, but that dry every year, what kind of adaptations uh, do the uh, invertebrates have in those systems? So again, we used um, the paired benthic hyperig approach. Um, Matt Johnson, now at Nottingham Uni, um, was one of my humble field assistants um, using this. Yeah, you just hammer pipes in and then pump the critters up. Simple. Um, Paul made that. 
um, in his garage, I believe. Um, so temporary rivers, just to give you a definition, and they're actually, all you've got to do to count as a temporary river is stop flowing. So in theory, you can have a channel full of water, but if it isn't moving, then you do tick the box. But I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in systems that dry. Most of us are, and most of these systems do dry to isolated pools or completely. Um, so conceptually, it's some of these systems, they're dry nine months a year, and we still think of them as streams. You can think of them as terrestrial ecosystems that are sometimes inundated, or you can think of them as, as sediments, permanent sediments that shift between aquatic and terrestrial states. Um, but yes, I came at it like most people as a, as a freshwater ecologist, thinking of them as rivers that sometimes dry. So my rivers, they didn't sometimes dry, they always dried. We carefully selected them for that reason, um, that they, yes, they always dried. Um, so we had two as well, just in case. Uh, the Lathkill in the Peak District, uh, cast limestone, and also um, anthropogenic losses to underlying mining drainage levels. And then also uh, the Glen in Lincolnshire. Um, oh, I was talking to Richard Judd about this the other day, and it is a casty sort of chalk, um, or maybe a chalky sort of cast, I'm not quite sure. But nonetheless, these sinkholes open up, so the intermittence is a bit more unpredictable, and it's also more affected by obstruction. Uh, so those were my two rivers. I had a total of nine sites um, across the two trips of the Glen and five on the Lathkill. Um, so half and half-ish perennial and intermittent. So we could compare um, the invertebrate community response to drying. And at each point, we had four sampling points. Um, so at each one, the benthic and hyperic uh, samples collected, and also these peat summiters are to see if the sites are upwelling or downwelling. Uh, what did we do? Uh, so three levels of hyperic bugs, not that that's important. Um, and then a benthic sample from right uh, on the uh, same site. So very much the same area. So this is my, the hydrograph, thank you, John Gunn, um, which this is downstream. So you'd expect discharge to be a bit higher. Um, in a, this, yes, I think it's in a perennial reach. Um, and so we were feeling confident at this point that it was about to dry. And then it rained. Oh, yeah. I, I felt a bit faint at that point. I thought, oh, my career is over. But no, it's all right. Having those four sampling points, those time points, monthly, look at that flow recession. That is a beautiful thing. And also an unplanned before and after spate um, opportunity to study. So, yes, we were able to make the most of this. Um, but again, we had to say, well, that flow recession, that looks, that looks like a delight. What's stressful about it this time? This time we are right. You can see the groundwater welling up. It's not getting that hot as in the um, Little Stour. Temperatures adamantly remaining um, quite moderate um, and comparable in the benthic and hyperic zones um, as well. But huge declines in reduced habitat availability. So this is site four for some reason, and you can see just how much of the uh, submerged habitat was lost. And uh, a similar pattern, uh, really all of the sites. So I've shown, yes, photos for two um, and uh, the cross sections for two. So you've got that reduction in habitat availability at the same time, the gamerous, they, they're having to move into a smaller space in order to re remain in submerged habitat. 
So as depth declined, the benthic densities of Gamera's pulex um, shot up. And they're supposed to be, they're not shredders, they anything. They, yes, quite happy to eat each other. And so as they're moving into a smaller space, you've got real intensification of biotic interactions. These things, they were very um, abundant, I think up to 6,000 or so individuals per meter um, squared. So that is a biotic um, stress. Uh, so in response, we, so we saw an increase in benthic densities. We also saw an increase in hyperic um, densities. Um, well, yes, you're comparing um, an area with a volume, so let's let's um, be a bit cautious with the word densities. But what we did also was look at the that of, the, of all the gamerids that were present, what proportion is in the hyperic zone, and that. Um, I'm going to show you a horrendous um, conceptual kind of diagram in a second. And all I want you to take away from it is this is the most convincing evidence that you can get if you've got the benthic, no, hyperic uh, densities increasing and the hyperic proportion of the population increasing, then it doesn't really matter what happens to the benthic um, population if you've got those two increases then we've got evidence of active refuge use. It's, it's really common to see the hyperic zone described as a, a refuge, but of all the studies that I could find uh, about 10 years ago, most of them don't actually demonstrate that the cutters burrow down. It's just, oh, they just happen to be there. So, they're just lucky um, that they happen to be in the hyper the hyperic zone, and so they survive. Whereas what we did, and what just a handful of other studies have done, um, is demonstrate active um, evidence that they actively moved in um, to the hyperic zone. Uh, yeah, gloss over that. But the hyperic zone. Oh, it, by, by its definition, not that you need to worry about its definition, but it is saturated. That's the whole point of it. But the water table, it could well keep declining. So you could end up with these dry subsurface sediments. And at that point, freshwater ecologists usually walk away and just assume um, that everyone dies, but not Paul Wood. Oh no! Um, I, did you get? I think you got the idea from Andrew Bolton. Most of the good ideas in our discipline, you know, Andrew had them a while ago. Um, so Paul um, got. It, look at him uh, overseeing the work of his mud collectors. Um, so digging up dry sediments um, to inform uh, rehydration experiments. So I've been involved in a couple of uh, papers looking at this idea of the invertebrate seed bank, which does not contain any seeds. Apparently, it should be called the propagule reservoir, but that isn't catchy. So a um, bit of background. Uh, in rivers that dry, the communities, we know they persist, but they are thought to be resilient. In other words, they're knocked out, but they bounce back quickly, they recover quickly through recolonization, whereas their resistance, their capacity to persist in situ uh, in the dry reach is described as low. Um, but that's because we don't bother rehydrating sediments. If you do, then there are plenty of dormant things, um, eggs, juveniles, adults as well, that, that are surviving. So that's the, so the seed bank is any and um, viable life stage of an aquatic invertebrate that persists um, despite the loss of free water. And so this, if, if you rehydrate, um, then you can greatly increase um, your um, idea of, 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 is that a refuge? Is that enabling um, macroinvertebrate persistence? So a couple of papers, Paul, um, was 
he kindly let me contribute to one that Adam Greenwood had led as part of the BSC Nuffield project. Um, and then I also did uh, one that I'm going to talk about for a couple of slides now, where uh, me and Thibaut Dutchie, uh, we compiled all of the seed bank studies we could find and did a global analysis to try and uh, document their importance. Um, and quite a lot in it, really. So a mean of uh, 12 taxa per seed bank across, it was around 10 studies. Um, and I think four of those were UK, but a couple of America and a couple of Australia and France. Um, so a biased, but um, what we could get. Um, so highest in temperate France, but some of those samples were taken very soon um, after flow, uh, after water was lost. And what we really want to know is who, who survives right till the end. Um, so that is probably an overestimate. Um, who did we find? Um, no surprises for guessing. Uh, coronamids and worms. Uh, but in addition, lots of uh, true fly larvae, uh, lots of different families, lots of caddis larvae, um, particularly um, the new, I think there was a New Zealand study that um, supplied a few of those taxa, and lots of beetles, dytiscids, um, and the like. And oh, I must mention my one lonely stonefly. The type, at the end of the experiment, so most people rehydrate buckets straight away at the end of summer um, for about a month and I dutifully cleared away most of my experiments but there was one bucket that I left over winter and I did not um, explore it until the following spring and that is the one bucket um, that had a Brachyptera risi in it and so that is telling us perhaps um, if we did much longer rehydration experiments with a cold period um, in them that we could find uh, a lot more uh, life surviving in there. But no evidence that the shrimps or the mayflies can hang on very long in those sediments. Um, it looks like seed banks could be really more important in temperate climates. So if we have a look at, so important, uh, bad word, um, but we just defined it as the proportion of flowing river taxa that were present in the rehydrated sediments. And this is about 0.8 up here, um, about 0.2 down there. And so temperate England, it just, it must be easier to, if you're an aquatic critter, just dry sediments in the UK, they're just not as dry our sediments in the UK, are they? This is probably rained in the morning. And so with those regular inputs of moisture, just helping to keep the seed bank going. And so we found that, yes, the proportion uh, was higher. Um, yeah, that exception there in an arid zone is because of a high proportion of very few critters, uh, very few taxa uh, in that case. So abundance, some evidence that abundance drops off pretty sharpish, but um, that uh, richness declines more gradually but nonetheless is maintained but yes what we really want to see now um, is what happens what do you find if you sample it right towards the end of a dry phase so that was partly my phd research and um, i also got diverted but going back to the end of my phd then just throughout much of it I, I really, there was one thing I knew, and it was that I did not um, want to go into lecturing. And then, oh, I went to a runner. This is not a runner. And um, this is Val Rosegg, but a comparable um, landscape and a comparable experience um, of teaching. And yes, that changed my mind. And so having decided I did want to um, uh, secure a lectureship. There was only one university for me. Oh yes, it's one of Nottingham's top two. Um, Trent. Uh, so yes, the day after my PhD funding ran out, I started 
uh, a, a permanent uh, half-time lectureship and it was quite intense. Um, I just, I, I was module leader for this um, first year cell biology module which involved running labs with hundreds, literally about a hundred students in there. We opened our swanky super lab and I was tasked with um, showing Bob and Parky round. It was, you know, a moment, it was a glorious moment. <laughs> um, but it was, I can remember Paul saying to me um, in these uh, days, just try and keep publishing something. And um, working with students uh, helped me to do that. Um, Atish, he's emailed me this morning. He says he's got to teach today, um, so isn't here. But um, yeah, look, this is his experimental mesocosm facility a recirculating flume, um, also a cattle drinking trough with gravel in it, but um, worked very well. So uh, we've published a few papers looking at experimental approaches to documenting those uh, vertical migrations in response to drying. Um, and also, yeah, JP was uh, a BSc student of mine and that did a summer project with me. Ah, oh, look, that's Marie-Jo Dole Olivier. <laughs> She's such a hero. Um, and yes, um, she, she taught us how to use this uh, bourouche uh, method of sampling uh, hyperic invertebrates. So I kept things ticking over and then smires happened. I smired, if you're French. And uh, yes, yeah, so and I, I must acknowledge John Sadler at this point. I, it could have been him who joined instead of me, but he said, you have it all. Um, thank you, John. Um, it did indeed change my life, um, not least um, because on the very first trip in 2016, I met Judy England from our environment agency. Um, and yes, uh, just a, a random assortment of shots. And so I've done, yes, training schools to support early career researchers. Uh, there's been a lot of working group meetings to advance particular scientific goals, as well as, yes, it's primarily a cost action, is primarily a networking um, uh, project. And so we, yes, we built a network um, as well as, uh, and then jointly uh, progressed the scientific goals. Um, so, but it brought me and Judy together, and yeah, since then we've had these annual meetings at Nottingham Trent, um, and they have really um, helped us bring together a community of like-minded uh, managers and uh, academics, and it's also enabled us to secure funding and to establish, uh, this was uh, our most, yes, there's, there's only three of us at the moment, but there were, there were eight at one point, Emma taking the photo as well. Um, so uh, to, yes, to, to do a few projects that I'll now talk about. Um, so these meetings uh, are, that are dominated by um, UK river researchers, um, they brought together me and, uh, well, for some reason this in led to Lee Brown, who's one of the editors for Wires, um, inviting us to uh, write an article about temporary streams. And so trying to change perceptions from, in, in the UK, a dry stream is so not often seen as, as symbolizing drought and human impacts and abstraction. And it's so difficult because sometimes it, it is due to over abstraction, but we need to balance that with recognition that sometimes the drying is natural. So in this paper, um, we said, look, they, oh, you even get, you get ones that cease to flow in Scotland because they have um, frozen, not because they've dried magic. I love that that's a temporary stream. Peatland ones and bedrock ones, alluvial ones, oh, that one's in the temperate zone in New Zealand. Um, and of course, our cast and chalk streams uh, in England as well. Um, so thinking about their overall diversity, everyone says, well, their diversity is lower than in perennial systems. And that is true. If you take one sample, 
and you look at its um, low tick uh, richness, taxonomic richness, or its local alpha diversity. But it's got some specialists. This is this is um, Paralectic Abrica werneri. It's a beauty, and it only occurs in temporary streams. Um, you're probably an exception to that, but it certainly does much better. In temporary streams, and there's yes, stone flies and uh, black flies as well. Um, and in addition, what if you consider everything that lives in in that one space over over time? So the changes between temporary uh, between terrestrial um, and aquatic, and with the lentic and lotic contributions, um, and so and, and also that will enhance spatial variability. So this idea of beta diversity variability in communities in space and time. I'm now going to say the same things, but supported by some delightful conceptual models. Sorry. Um, so these are in the wires paper. Um, so sometimes uh, temporary streams, this is a plan view looking down at a river network. Um, sometimes they do have lower diversity. But at the end of a long flowing phase, it could well be equivalent. And just occasionally, you find that they've got more diversity even during flowing phases, more taxonomic richness um, due to habitat heterogeneity. Uh, you also find more differences between sites, uh, again, due to differences in the local environmental conditions. And also, you find spatial differences. Hmm. Uh, along a gradient. Sorry, something's gone wrong with the coding there. Never mind. Um, and so all of these, yeah, so at a network scale, um, you might have a comparable diversity. And in addition, if you think about what's going on over time, you've got far more profound change um, going on uh, within a temporary reach uh, compared to uh, a perennial one, far more changes between flowing, cool and dry phases. So gamma diversity, total the regional species pool, the network species pool. We don't know enough yet to say if it's greater, different, um, comparable to a perennial one or not. But there's certainly a lot to suggest that it's buoyed up by contributions of different taxa. <clears throat> This will take too long. Oh, but it's such a pretty wheel. So this is my wheel of invertebrate misfortune. Um, so trying to conceptualize what is happening with the generalists, the field symbols, and the specialists. So diversity, richness might increase over time. Um, for Well, it will. That's uh, a given for the lotic taxa. The lentic ones, um, also, uh, we don't know about any lentic specialists, ones that only live in temporary stream pools. I think they're more opportunistic than that. What I really want to know, though, is are there any inundation tolerant terrestrial taxa? That specialise. There are, you know, there's evidence from other countries that they might have some, but um, have have we got any? There's definitely some from floodplains, um, but uh, yes, it's less certain in temporary streams. Then, as we go into the pool phase, you can actually, as as flow ceases, you can actually have a peak of lotic diversity at that point, um, because everything's crammed into one space so there's a lot of taxa but they're all bloody miserable and um, so it soon declines um, but at the same time you have your flying ones your bugs and your beetles and um, they've, they've spotted the pools they are in there and exploiting those habitats and um, what about when it dries so our seed bank work has shown that a decent proportion of the community can persist but how much does it decline from those first um, days of the dry, the dry phase through to the end? Um, a few of those taxa are, yeah, maybe lentic uh, loving digestives as well. And then the terrestrial ones are increasing during that phase, but are there any specialists? 
Um, and of course, we're not actually going to have um, four months low, four months bonding, four months dry, that's ridiculous. Um, and so, yes, those uh, wheels just to indicate that there could be an awful lot of different temporal drying patterns to consider. Oh, onwards. And we got some funding to, this was um, NTU funding. We got six weeks. And Kate Mothers is awesome. She delivers a lot in six weeks. Um, so this got us going. We're thinking about how drought, not just how it affects perennial and near perennial sites, but also setting drought within the context of long-term variability, um, long-term hydrological variability, and also differences between sites with a whole range of flow regimes. Um, so Kate got us going, thank you. Um, and then Ro kept us going. Um, so he uh, was in, with us at NTU for coming up two years. Um, uh, he's now uh, in Ray with um, Debo Dutchie. Um, and Judy gave him a big old data set to play with. Um, lots of years, 26, lots of sites, uh, 46 on seven rivers. And so perhaps it was the impacts of drought on near perennial sites that helped get us the funding. But we were also able to explore um, uh, bigger questions. So I don't think I've got much time to go through these, but just to say that this Oikos study not only did it um, benefit from that, uh, a subset of that immense temporal and spatial resolution, but also respects to Cal Sefton et al at CEH. They have got monthly state observations, monthly for 14 years at these 30 sites across seven rivers. It's, it's amazing to um, be able to play with this um, data. So I encourage you to have a look at the Sefton paper. Uh, apologies, Judy, I have um, rotated um, your uh, <laughs> catchment to the north that way, but nonetheless. Um, we explored, yes, having those hydrological observations meant we could look not just at the local drying regime, but also what was going on in the catchment, what was the spatial extent of flowing reaches in the catchment, what was the spatial distribution of flowing in relation to ponding, yeah. in relation to drying, I'm, how much heterogeneity was there. <laughs> Um, Sorry, Someone's talking. Shush. Thank you. No, he's, he's going to call them back. It's all right. Mm -hmm. um, and we looked at um, biodiversity at three scales. So local, um, between site and between time differences, and then gamma, the regional species pool. And basically what we found was that some of those local drivers, the proportion of um, months in flowing ponded and dry phases at one site affected local diversity, but it was the regional scale drivers that really determined the differences among sites. For example, as the extent of flow in the catchment increased, spatial variability and community composition decreased um, because of um, uh, flow allowing uh, greater dispersal. Gamma diversity didn't, however, vary. I knew it. Haven't got time to do the ecological indicators one. I spent about six hours reading the Chad paper <laughs> and, the, and um, yeah, the, who proposed this um, drought effect of habitat loss index and seeing how Rowe's uh, research complemented that. Um, so uh, basically it allowed, yes, we showed the performance was best for Delhi at near perennial sites, um, but yeah, the intermittent sites uh, were more difficult to characterise. And so this is really showing us that we also need to consider um, non-aquatic taxa um, and the semi-aquatics as well 
Um, and so that brings us on to England et al. And a quick shout out for Judy's mid index paper. So this is an index that includes, look, they're all semi aquatic and this is where the terrestrial list starts. So considering all of those taxon specific responses within an index to characterize responses to intermittents as well. So we've now got these tools um, for documenting responses to, to drying. Um, but what I really want to know is, can we characterize ecological health, the ecological status of temporary rivers? So we've, there's a two pronged attack. Um, the dry phase communities that are not just the aquatic things that are persisting in the seed bank. Um, so in fact, I'll come on to this one briefly. So at this paper we're from 2019, we thought about dry phase indicators of ecological status. And we used everything that was available and it was all aquatic organisms. Doesn't make any sense. Um, so George's research and Chloe's research have been thinking about the terrestrial um, dry phase um, communities. Can we use them to assess ecological status or are they just really responding um, to moisture? So that's um, a big question. So uh, Chloe's PhD, uh, Judy is co-supervising and uh, Chloe likes her plants um, and so that's that site there, it, it, it makes it look bad, doesn't it? What is there to characterise? But um, if we look close up and if we look at these six images, you can see that there's a lot of variability among sites. And so, yes, complementing um, the plant equivalents of Delhi, perhaps the plant flow index that Chris Westwood um, and colleagues have developed uh, that documents responses to intermittents. What can we find out about how these terrestrial communities are responding to uh, aspects of ecological quality? And so look out for Chloe's research on that um, in the coming months and years. Uh, George Bunting uh, was, oh, is there not actually, oh, George, that was George. Um, so he was with our team for 10 months and he documented dry phase invertebrate communities and the key point about this was that even there was not a lot of variability. Look at those dry phase lengths, two weeks, 63 weeks and a hundred. Yeah, so over three years um, that they'd been dry when we sampled in summer and then uh, nine weeks and longer periods um, when we sampled in autumn. So we tried a couple of methods. We focused on identification of the beetles and wood lice, um, and we calculated richness, uh, abundance, and an index of uh, rarity as much as anything, um, and just loads of taxa, and also loads of taxa simply within the beetles and the isopods. There were so many taxa spiders, we just called them spiders. And Chloe's probably going, oh, because she knows that there are loads of species of spiders that live in dry channels. And um, springtails, Alan can, not so. He says springtails are easy to identify. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what can we? Can we use them as indicators of ecological status? So it's so exciting um, to think about what these. Uh, communities that we've never considered before. Are they just responding to moisture or, or can we use them um, for more than that? And I think I can go straight on to the next slide. Um, seven day pitfall traps were, yeah, better than hand searches and shorter pitfall traps for documenting richness, definitely. But look, the ones that have been dry for two weeks, they had, yeah, um, had more taxa than the ones that have been dry for three years. So that indicates that actually you can go out soon after drying and still get um, uh, a decent number of taxa, a decent number of individuals and estimate 
um, the site quality. But we are at such an early stage. I mean, look, we can hardly say, well, that site had a longer, yeah, it also is a grassy ditch um, compared to these ones. That there's so much difference in the sediments, um, in the plant communities. We, we're well aware that there's a lot still to do. Um, so at the moment, we're simply saying, look, the carabids in particular could be useful. Uh, oh, yeah, and we also recorded a few rarities, nationally rare or scarce, ones associated with damp habitats. So that's uh, an indicator that these um, dry channels could be relatively moist channels if you are a discerning beetle. So George's paper is out in Wedge, um, and it's the second study ever that I'm aware of to simultaneously consider aquatic and terrestrial organisms. Uh, I must mention Kieran's work. Uh, he's going to continue where George left off. Just a certain, now he's been allowed out now. Look, there he is, putting sensors. And so we're, doing, we're using temperature sensors to document patterns of flow. And this is, yes, this is already attracting attention um, from hydrology colleagues um, and will greatly inform uh, his understanding of the uh, communities. We're hoping to do far more with the terrestrial invertebrate communities. Um, from this spring, his field campaigns will start. Um, fingers, yes, it's going to happen, definitely. <gasps> no time for Indy. Okay, so what I really want to do is enable accurate ecological status assessments in temporary rivers during dry phases, potentially using um, terrestrial fauna, um, but also we do also need to look at the aquatic invertebrate communities and see can we disentangle their responses to quality from their responses to intermittence. And so I've been trying to do this for a couple of years. Um, Richard Chads, um, as well as Judy, has been um, on board since um, this opinion piece um, in Stoughton um, in 2018. And um, we've just submitted, it's under, it's gone to review, it's gone last week, went to review. And try, and this is a global analysis trying to disentangle responses. Um, but the recommendations that we've made in that paper, they've already given us a vision of what we need to do in the UK. And so we have formed a core team um, of starting to enact the disentangling recommendations. And we've identified that ASPTs, with, well, James White did it first, granted. Um, but we've um, advanced the idea that um, richness independent measures of quality uh, can have independent responses to drying and to impacts. So that means we can use uh, an ASPT to assess quality, um, but we need to calibrate it first. So we need to define our reference communities, our expected communities, at unimpacted sites, but that could just be one taxon. So we need a measure of richness as well. And um, so we need to define a richness list of the expected, the adapted, the drying adapted taxa um, that are occurring. And we're going to start by focusing on the chalk, the winter borns, and um, that have regular drying simply because that is currently um, the ecosystem type for which we have data. Um, totally recognising that there are a huge diversity of other temporary stream sites um, in the UK alone. Come to these conferences and find out more about disentangling. So there are two temporary river sessions coming up uh, online um, in the forthcoming months. Um, we've got one. Um, at the American meeting, SFS, um, in May, and then Dublin. I've always wanted to go to Dublin. Oh, yeah, Dublin. Um, Seth's um, will have a session uh, at that conference as well. So I hope you can make it. Oh, these people just, yeah, 
I, I obviously I have missed hundreds of people, but I could not do it without these people. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure um, to work with you. And that's Chris, my boss from NTU. He's also awesome. Uh, and finally, FBA. Love them. Been a member for a long time um, without fail. And I hope that you will also consider becoming a member if you are not. Got a whole minute for questions, Louise. That's brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. That's fantastic. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll crack on with questions. If anybody's got any questions, could you pop them into the chat box and we'll uh, we'll ask them now. We'll kick off with one um, about how does pollution affect the seed bank? And there's a couple of people interested in this. Ah, so that is something that we looked at um, in the 2019 paper that's published in Ecological Indicators. So this one, it's actually the only data set that we've got that can answer that question is from a Bolivian seed bank. And we did identify that, yes, um, that you could use a BMWP like metric um, based on the um, the seed bank tax are alone and you could identify differences and um, so definitely there you, you can pick up differences and so those differences in ecological um, quality will persist uh, into the seed bank uh, and the, yes will be reflected in the seed bank as well did that answer the question i think it did yep yeah. Has there a, well, I guess I have one as a follow up to that. Then has there been any work done on what types of pollutants have what types of effect on different taxa? I don't. I think all we've done so far is say that water pollution that you can still pick up the differences in water pollution, and um, after in using seed bank assemblages, I'm mm. not. There's considering that we used the only 10 studies we could find, and there's been about five more since. I, I think it's at too early a stage. People are still trying to establish um, what the seed bank is like um, at any sites. And yeah, so that is definitely um, something that, that needs to be addressed, looking at how, because people just, they look at dry streams and think, and just think of them as devoid of life. So, and, and tread on them. And things like that, and and I think that they're improved. There's there's work at the moment um, coming out saying, oh, let us pump sewage laden effluent into streams to support their flow. Oh, don't do that. Um, <laughs> like a brilliant idea. So, so yeah, we, we we need to accompany it with reconceptualization um, of the idea, and and I think we've started to do that. So I say we, not just me. Oh no, um, that yes, the global um, perceptions have started to change towards thinking of a dry stream as being full of, yeah, not just terrestrial life, but still full of aquatic things hanging on in there. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, somebody here um, is looking to, uh, somebody's just put something that's moved up. Um, I'd like to investigate some drying streams on Lundy. Can you point me to a paper with um, methodologies that they might be able to use, please? Uh, sorry, I missed the first few words. Somebody's uh, doing an investigation um, on drying streams in Lundy, and uh, they'd like to to look at some papers with methodology that they might be able to use. Can you what suggest? What would they like to paper? sample? Um, I would say that. Where is it? First slide. Email me. I will point you in the direction um, of those papers in a jiffy. That's great. Lovely. Thank you. Um, We've got another one here. Um, no, that's not a comment. Um, one paper suggested fine sediment disrupts the vertical migration of gamma. Does it also affect horizontal movement? And, but this person's not sure how much they move about vertically or horizontally anyway. It certainly, yeah, Atisha's work in the cattle drinking trough um, and subsequent experiments, yeah, fine sediment. Um, it's, it's definitely, yeah, they're, they're screwed. I'm trying to get into the um, hyperic zone if it's too uh, calmated. So, but 
horizontal movements. I mean, we we know from from quite a bit of research that because horizontal, yeah, I, I don't know any more than the um, average person about and how fine sediment. I think it would affect your overall community composition. It probably does affect horizontal movement, doesn't it? Because if you look at the experimental work, you. Could, um, I'm thinking of Steve Rice um, and colleagues work at Loughborough, thinking about how things move around individual sediment particles and taking the path with the most protection, the least resistance. Uh, and so I imagine if all of that, um, all, if all of those pathways are blocked um, by fine sediment, that that's, oh yeah, you've got far less choice then, haven't you, about which way to wander. So I'm going to, <laughs> uh, that's a bit of a non-expert response. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we've got another one here. Um, indices of ecological quality are stateless in perennial systems, always based on um, research on, on species requirements and knowledge of their population biology. Um, but this person saying we, we have nothing like so much knowledge um, of much most of the species in intermittent systems. So can we can we shortcut that phase, or should we shortcut that phase, or what can we do to address but, that? No, no, the vast majority um, of taxa, if we're thinking about the aquatic invertebrates, then I would say ninety five percent of the taxa are in common with um, good quality perennial streams um, or poor quality ones, and so we can transfer that knowledge of their environmental requirements across um, and we're certainly uh, in developing the new index we're certainly yeah for our um, aspect of ecological quality we're not considering uh, changing the WHPT uh, index we want to yes to facilitate uptake uh, uptake of any new approach we certainly want to work within the confines uh, of the WHPT index. But I was looking, I realised that um, thinking about Judy's MIS index and bringing in the semi aquatics and the terrestrials, um, that some of the beetles, uh, Cuculionidae, uh, for example, the semi aquatic beetles that used to get a five in uh, BMWP, but then were removed from a WHPT. So do we need to bring some of those tax servers back in? So and, and then we are, yeah, we're, we're then reliant really on existing literature and expert judgment because the chances of getting any um, funding for autocology research looking at um, uh, species specific responses to uh, defined stressors, I'd say that has pretty slim. But we have got experts who can have a good think and uh, be able to give us some indication of environmental preferences. Yeah, we need we do need to know more about the semi-aquatics in indices, definitely. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's all for now. And since we're um, over time and people probably want to go and get lunch if they haven't already, I think we'll We'll leave that there, but that's that's brilliant. Thank you, Rachel, for that. That's, that's been an excellent talk. Thank you so much. A pleasure. So, uh, yeah, all that's left to say is um, we will upload this uh, recording if people didn't manage to, to make it uh, later on this week. Uh, so look out for that. And our next seminar will be on the uh, 24th of February um, for our next talk, where I'll be talking about the FPA's conservation work with freshwater pearl mussels and endangered species reintroductions. So information about that will be made available on the website shortly. And um, so uh, we will see you perhaps on the 24th.